Lego. 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 Hey, everybody, welcome back to Back to Brick. I'm your host, Garrett, and this is the podcast where we talk with fellow AFOLs from around the world about their designs and how they went about building them. And we get down to the bricking news every week to see what Lego's been up to for the past week. Today, we're going to have a special guest with a designer. The designer goes by Jonathan, and you might know him better as J E underscore Brickworks on Instagram. And you can also see his J E Brickworks.com. First off, thank you for coming coming on Jonathan how are you doing today I'm doing great thank you and look really really excited to be here it's a great opportunity to to have a chat about all things Lego yes and that's that's what we're here for talk about some Lego and definitely have like-minded people to discuss it you know just for our listeners I'd love to have you give a little bit of your background where you're from what do you like to build yeah sure look, I'm, as you can probably tell from my by accent, I'm from the UK, still based in the UK. Yeah, I, I pretty much build cars. I mean, my, my Instagram profile reads, I'm a grown man who builds small cars <laughs> from bricks. So yeah, this is, this is me. Nice. Yeah, I've, there are quite a few cars, and I, there's some really unique ones too, which we can definitely get into talking about and how you go about building these. Uh, and first off, though, I always start with if you had a signature figure or minifigure that would best represent you, and it doesn't have to be realistic, what would it be? I mean, this is it's, this is a fun question. I think it's uh, it's it's very interesting because anatomically, um, I couldn't be much further away from a minifig, really, um, in that I'm quite tall and I'm really very slim. So yeah, the most un minifigure like <laughs> person you're ever likely to meet. And I'm afraid to say, kind of yeah, if I were to make it reflect me in real life, it, it would be pretty monochromatic. I, I am guilty of wearing an awful lot of black. I sometimes mix it up with a bit of grey. So yeah, if you can imagine a kind of extruded, tall, thin minifig wearing mostly <laughs> black, uh, with a pair of glasses and and a five o'clock shadow, this is me. I'm assuming that from the cars you build, you wouldn't be able to to fit in them as a minifigure. No, I mean I have to say I don't. I don't really. But yeah, I, I don't really build with 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 minifigures in in mind anyway. Just so that I can kind of really, I guess, free myself up to to have as many techniques as uh, in there as I can get away with. And you know, I've got the greatest respect for people who, you know, will always really carefully build things to accommodate minifigs. It's a, it's a real skill to do that. But that real estate is too valuable for me. So. We'll definitely talk about that more because just based on your designs, how those kind of come about. Let's talk about your background a little bit. When do you think you started getting into Lego or had your first Lego set? Yeah, it would have been very, very young. I mean, I can just about remember because I'm, I'm, I'm getting quite old now, but way back in the kind of early 70s, at kindergarten, play school, as we call it in the UK, um, I have to confess, I used to kind of steal Lego without really realizing that it was the wrong thing to do because it was cool and I had a lot of it. And, I, you know, I remember bringing home uh, the, the really old school wheels where you had the kind of two by two brick with the, the metal axle and the red wheels on mm -hmm. either end and, and the really old smooth style tires, like the kind of dually tires and things like that. I vividly remember kind of putting them in my pocket and taking them home. In fact, it's probably one of my earliest memories. So yeah, I started pretty young. So you were taking them from the school? Yeah, kind of taking them home from the school. I'm fair, I, I'd like to say I took them back and kind of left them there sometimes <laughs> as well. But, and that's kind of what I can remember. I remember a big box of Lego, whether we kind of inherited some of it as a family. You know, my sister and I mm -hmm. were probably given some by relatives or friends, and, you know, my parents, colleagues. Just, yeah, this big, big box of all sorts of random, really, really old school Lego, very square and, <laughs> and not as exciting as the new stuff, I guess. But. So most of the time you didn't have Lego sets back then. Um, I, I think we had a couple of sets and I, I was, I really can't remember any of the kind of system stuff being bought, but I do remember being very incredibly proud to get some technical Lego as it was called then. It wasn't even Technic. Um, I remember getting the original red tractor, the yellow forklift truck when the, it really was just sort of new on the market. And you know, it, I was very proud to be having these sets that kind of said, you know, ages nine to 16 and, and thinking, hey, I'm seven and I'm building this stuff quite easily and really enjoying it. And so, yeah, it, it did my ego no end of good. <laughs> uh, very popular and uh, uh, showing it off to all the friends. 
Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I think I've got a couple of Polaroid pictures, you know, which I've still got somewhere in, in my very small box of treasures that I've kept of, of some kind of builds of mine and, and things like that from way back in the day. So maybe, maybe one day I'll, I'll scan them in and, and, and put them on Instagram. I did that once with old hard drives. I'd find like the our, our old computer, take them apart, found some fun videos and pictures from amazing designs I had. And then you look back. Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of color. Uh, yeah, a lot of it, yeah, there's there's a lot of color. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of Rainbow <laughs> Warriors, I guess. But yeah. yeah. And, you know, as you continued with Lego, uh, when do you think you started building your own, well, in this case, the cars? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of had a, I had a very long, I, I think, I believe the term is Dark Ages. I had a, a quite extended Dark Ages. So I, I foolishly sold all my Lego at the age of 14 because bikes were, were far more interesting than Lego at that stage, which is sad. Um, and then, yeah, I guess it was around, I think it was 2014. Um, I just sort of suddenly had this epiphany that I was an adult and I could kind of do what I wanted to do. And, and if I wanted to buy some Lego, I'd buy some Lego. And I'd been having dreams about Lego. I'm a bit weird like that. I have dreams about cars that I used to own and I wish I still did. And then I wake up and I'm disappointed because I don't have it anymore. And I used to dream a lot about Lego and I used to you know, kind of wake up and think, oh yeah, I could build that or I could build that if only I still had some. I thought it was high time to get it. So that was kind of when I, I first started getting back into it again. And what year did you say that was? It was 2014. So, yeah, my partner oh, at the time was yeah. traveling quite a lot. So mm -hmm. I, was, I was kind of using some time at home to kind of indulge myself a little bit. And so I started building some quite large scale things. And in fact, I could kind of. I discovered BrickLink and I could go and buy the bits and pieces that I wanted. And yeah, I was doing some quite big and quite elaborate stuff. And then, yeah, I, I then started building a few small cars just as sort of little evening projects and things to do a bit quicker than some of these kind of very grand, huge Technic models that I was building. And, and yeah, sort of really got a taste for them. And so when you started up, you started building the Technic models uh, that were the vehicles. Is that? Is yeah, that right? yeah, exactly. Yeah, just kind of ground up stuff. And, you know, again, the, the Internet is such a such a cool resource. So kind of if I wasn't quite sure how to build a gearbox, I'd you know have a look and find out how to do that. So, yeah, I was building some quite large scale stuff, um, sort of hot rods and off road vehicles and things like that. And just trying to get as many features into them as I could. But as I say, that was really time consuming. So. Yeah, and especially with the scale, I've seen. Well, I see now that looking at your Instagram, you know, you have the Ford Model A rod, um, and it's a blend of Technic and system parts. Decide to put that as your first post on Instagram. Um, it was it was one of the kind of earliest models that I had some half reasonable pictures of, and I was yeah, I was kind of I was really pleased with how it turned out as well, and it had a lot of features in it. Um, you know, the engine worked, it had the kind of really weird kind of push rod operated steering system that old hot rods have. They don't have any of the kind of rack and pinion stuff. And I managed to get everything working on it pretty well. So, yeah, it was it was one I took quite a few pictures of. And it was one of the early things that I put onto Flickr when I first had my Flickr account as well. So. And, you know, that was a large scale, like you said, and it looks like you've done a few larger scale, but you started going down and you said that was based on, you know, the compli uh, how complicated they were or just how the time frame it was to build these. Yeah, I mean, that was that was basically, yeah, you know, I, I kind of I, I naively thought, you know, I can build a really small kind of six wide car in an, in an evening. And, and of course you can. Um, and kind of started doing that just for a bit of fun. Um, you know, it was, it was a lot easier just if I had a free evening to build something small rather than to think, okay, I can take a couple of hours to work out how to get fourth gear working on this gearbox. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of where it started. And I, and I posted a couple of them onto Flickr. And then I, I got an invitation from a guy, and, and I have to confess I can't remember the guy's name, um, through, and it was through Mop Pages, I think. It was like a little um speed champions build contest um because he'd seen some little renault 5 builds again are way down at the bottom of my instagram feed <laughs> and uh, yeah i thought hey why not let's have it let's have a go i didn't really know what speed champions were at that point to be honest and it was just all kind of lego so i had a look into it had a look at you know how they were put together some of the some of the pieces that were used and and 
yeah, entered a couple of cars in this in this competition. Um, I didn't win it. Kind of got a, a special mention for for one of them, which was nice. But that just kind of suddenly ignited a <clears throat> a different way of kind of looking at things and building things. And um, yeah, and then I, I I just sort of got more into it. Yeah, because I mean to do that and being invited, you know, hey, uh, you have either potential or you're going to be awesome at this. <laughs> and th I've through these interviews, I've noticed that a lot of people, their competitions has really brought out a lot of people. Yeah, I think so. And, and, and I think it's, I think it's great. And it was kind of an early introduction, of, I, I guess, for me into the kind of community side of things. And, and, and I'm not, you know, I must confess, I'm not hugely active. I'm in touch with, with a few other builders and kind of chat to them from time to time. You know, I'm, I'm always, you know, always glad to receive kind of comments and, you know, get into discussions with people about things. But that kind of early thing of just sort of really being encouraged to take part in something and, and just really opened my eyes to the fact that it's such a great, community you know and and so many people are doing doing cool things there are a lot of people out there that like to build lego cars so have you had inspiration or ha do you know of people that have been inspired by some of your builds yeah i mean it's 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 an interesting one i think we all kind of people building kind of cars tend to kind of take inspiration from each other i've certainly seen a few things and tricks that that I've implemented in other people's models, and for sure I've I've, I've borrowed some things from other people. I mean, I think in terms of people who whose work I like in the kind of small scale stuff, Tim Henderson was like a really really early source of inspiration. You know, long before I had my Instagram account, always liked his kind of small scale stuff. He he you know he came up with some really interesting new ways of doing things. Isaac, who you interviewed recently, he just his stuff's wild. I mean, he 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 really doesn't worry about the rules and i don't think he'll mind me saying it he he just gets creative with things and it's really interesting seeing what he comes up with and the kind of techniques that he uses so yeah i mean that's those are kind of two who really spring to mind in terms of in terms of small scale cars and definitely with the small scale it's a challenge because you want to get as much detail as possible and just looking at yours you have quite a bit of detail let's just like kind of talk in general if you were to pick a model or a car that you're interested in building where do you kind of start? Do you have artwork? Yeah. Or... It's 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 a really good question, and and it can kind of start from a number of things because because I'm a I'm a massive petrol head, always have completely obsessed with with, with kind of cars, and I, and I've got a very good memory for for cars and the shapes of mm -hmm. cars. So sometimes I'll just want to build something, and there are thousands of cars out there that I want to build. Some of them I kind of have a gut instinct that I know they're going to work. And so I'll start having a play around with them. And sometimes that gut instinct is completely wrong and they don't work. And sometimes it can just be one single piece. So the little one by one plate with a, with a tooth that sort of hangs down on the front of it. The first time I saw that and I saw that it was available in gray, I think it was Buckbeak's beak in the, in the Harry Potter I mean, like minifig goodie bag or something. Mm -hmm. And I saw that in, and I saw it in the gray and I thought that looks like an Alfa Romeo grill. And that generated the whole build, just that one piece. I thought, okay, what can I do with this? How can I, how can I incorporate it? How can I get that one thing in the center of something that's six wide, which is going to be a challenge in itself? That kind of thing will, will inspire me as well. So I try and fit in as many details as I can. But what I tend to say, if anyone ever asks for kind of any, I guess, any tips or any advice is don't get too hung up on it. Because at that scale, you can't fit everything in. If you can find details that work quite easily with quite broad brush strokes, put them in if they make sense and they make you think of the car. But trying to cram everything in, you'll just end up with a mess at that scale because it's just it's, it's too small to, to fit everything in. I completely agree, especially just looking at your photos. There are things that are iconic about, you know, you've like you said, the Alfa Romeo, that tooth piece, it looks exactly like the grill, uh, which is if you look at any Alfa Romeo, that's the most iconic part. People will know just based on that. If you just took a picture of the front of vehicles, a lot of people know based on that. I'm not saying that that's for every vehicle, but if I'm looking at, let's say, your uh, Mustang, you can tell just based on, you know, you've had the curves or the paint job just the same way. That can be a challenge, especially at that scale. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, it, you know, as I said, I think it's working in kind of broad enough brush strokes. If you get the you've got to kind of think about proportions and get the proportions roughly right you know is is it a very cab forward design is it a car with a really long bonnet really long hood 
for, for, for anyone in the US. You know, where do the wheels sit in relation to the, to the length of the car? And, and you can kind of get that kind of stance and, and, and the proportions from it. You know, again, at this scale, you can, you can move backwards and forward by, you know, half a, half a stud. You can move up and down by half a plate if you use some kind of offsetting tricks and things like that. But in real life, those movements would be kind of 10 centimetres, four inches. You, you can't work from, at this scale, you can't work from blueprints, I don't think. There's no point trying to do it because you, you can't get close to it. And you've got to use the fact that, as you say, if you can get those kind of iconic details, I rely on the fact that I hopefully other people's eyes fill in the gaps in the same way that mine do. If you can get those familiar looking bits and you can get that overall stance right, you can make someone think it's a Range Rover or it's a Lamborghini Countach or whatever. And with these builds, are you digitally designing them first or it, or at all? Or is this just piece by piece? I've kind of I've kind of come come fully around to 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 digital now. So I used to be you know, proper old school with it and, and you know, everything's got to be built properly and built with real bricks. And, and I still enjoy building that way. Um, but I then started to, to use Studio 2 um, to primarily to create instructions. Um, so I'd build something first physically and then I'd kind of reverse engineer it in Studio 2. And I guess yeah, so the more familiar I've got with it, the lazier I've got. And it's a lot easier just to open a <laughs> laptop and to just uh, dump a pile of bricks on the on the kitchen table or whatever and start building. So it's a lot quieter as well. So I, I, I've kind of come around to that, but it's a, it's, a, it's a blessing and a curse, I have to say, because every single piece is available in every single color combination. If you want to do things legally, you can use the, the guidance on there to make sure that everything's available in those colors you can also cheat and you can build it in whichever colors you want which is fantastic for creativity but what i tend to find happens is i end up building something digitally and then i realize it can only be built in one color because i've used so many specific pieces and so many of the latest mm -hmm. pieces to get exactly what i want i then can't you know build it in different colors or i then go to buy the pieces like i did the other day i went to buy a bunch of stuff in sand blue and ended up spending six dollars on one headlamp brick because they're so rare but that's the i guess that's the flip side of of, of all of that user friendliness and the fact that you can do pretty much anything you want if you then want to translate it physically you can sometimes catch a bit of a cold and the number of times i've found something's available in dark green and then i find out there are four in the world um, because it's incredibly rare that can be a bit frustrating sometimes Oh, yeah. I mean, you're like, oh, it's available in BrickLink for $20 for one piece, and I've used 30 of them. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, exactly. Yeah. Uh, especially with the color combinations. Like, I, I really appreciate your Sand Blue Series 2 Disco uh, Land Rover. Is that Defender or Discovery? I think it was, it was a kind of precursor to the Defender. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I look at the windshield, I'm like, where? I don't even know where that windshield's from because sand blue is just so hard to find nowadays. And that's the thing. You look in BrickLink and sometimes they don't even have, or Studio, and they don't even have what might be available on BrickLink. Yeah, exactly. It, it can be difficult. I mean, that, that's actually a, a window from a bay window on, a, on some kind of architecture set. So it was actually reasonably available. It turned out it didn't have any glass in it. I had to put the glass in from a different color. But yeah, it's, um, yeah, some of that stuff can be can be tricky, but it's a, in a way that's kind of fun as well. Just trying to sort of source all that stuff and put it together and, and make it all work. So. Yeah, and similarly with the the wheels on that similar model, it, it looks like you've used discs instead of actual Lego produced wheels. Yeah, I, I tend to find with some with some builds they they start to started to get a sense that there's a kind of element of realism to it where then when I add in a, a, a kind of off the shelf wheel or something like that it just doesn't quite sit right with it mm -hmm. um, and yeah so in this instance I've used the kind of the, the two by two radar dishes they happen to be exactly the right diameter that you can fit them inside the kind of old smooth tires um and some of the some of the modern tires as well they will also kind of fit on there without kind of stretching and distorting things too much and i think they they can give that firstly they give that sort of slightly old school steel wheel look 
with the kind of dishing on them and then the the, the circle the circular center but also the color palette is so much broader again you can only kind of get so many wheels in so many colors and, and the classic Land Rovers had this, I believe the color was limestone, which was a kind of light tan color on the wheels. And I thought, if I want to make this look like an early Land Rover, I need to have that color on the wheels. So mm -hmm. luckily the dishes kind of stepped in and, and, and let me let me get that look. I've always loved uh, the Land Rover early models. And if we ever, are, you know, it's hard to get them in the United States, not as hard to get them in Britain, but I would love to like rebuild or buy one of them. Be and the colors, the classic colors, that sandy, yeah, yeah. Uh, almost uh, natural color adds to the uh, pristine look of, you know, a Land Rover. Yeah, they are. They are very cool. I've, I've never had one. I, I, I drove one briefly once and, and it was a, a friend of mine, uh, a mechanic and, and he used to have all sorts of all sorts of things turn up and he had this old school i think it was a series two land rover and you know i i needed to get something in to do some work on one of my own cars and he said oh you know go and move that land rover out of the way and, and i got into this thing and i couldn't believe you know, i'm not a particularly strong guy i've already said i'm, I'm very tall and skinny but I, I remember starting this thing up and then going to turn the steering wheel and, you know this is back in the day before many things had power steering my own cars didn't have power steering. I yeah. couldn't physically turn the steering wheel without moving the Land Rover forward. And my leg was quivering, you know, pushing the clutch pedal down because the, the controls on it were so, you know, it was like a tractor. It really was. So I think, again, being quite tall, they're not the best for tall people. They can be quite uncomfortable, but they're, they're a fantastic vehicle. They're so iconic. They're really, really great. They're just one of those examples where something you know, it, it it's not been designed by some some guy working for Pin and Farina or something like that. But the design of it, the proportions of it, are just so right. It's just a, a beautiful looking vehicle, even though it's incredibly utilitarian. Mm -hmm. And especially, I know that a lot of people are updating them now, and a lot of older cars as well, converting them to electric, giving them all the gizmos and doodads of <laughs> all our cars now: stereo system, suspension. Um, and it makes you know bringing back these classics just just as fun. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a it's an interesting. I've got kind of mixed feelings about it. I kind of like some some things to be to be left as as they are. I'm a I'm a huge fan of you know I, everything's got to be original. Like, you know, I, I never had stickers or anything like that in any of my cars. They were like, this is exactly how it would have left the production line. This is how it's got to be. But at the same time, I really I, I really do like modified cars as well. And I think if you know, again, if you kind of look through some of the stuff in my in my feed you'll see that you know I'd, I'd mess around with things and i modify things lower things add spoilers to things because you can kind of do it all quite easily and, and i appreciate people who do it in in real life a huge fan of kind of stance works a guy called mike burrows who who runs that he's he's rebuilding a ferrari 308 at the moment and he's put a honda k24 four cylinder turbocharged engine in it and he's upset a lot of ferrari purists but what he's doing is just <laughs> it's mind-blowing it's so cool so I kind of, yeah, I, I get both. An original 308 is a wonderful thing, but what he's doing to this is, is fantastic. He's creating something unique. So yeah, I kind of, I'm, I'm, I've am I'm got a foot in each camp and I'm, I'm quite happy with the balance. I'm a similar mindset because, you know, sometimes there are certain cars that should remain as they are and others I can see some changes. I'm, I'm a big proponent of electric, so I've seen some classic cars, VWs, Broncos, other things converted to electric. And I think it's cool because they're the same body, same everything, except the engine was replaced with some batteries and some electric motors. We have creativity with Lego and other people have some uh, bigger pockets <laughs> to be creative yeah, with absolutely. the vehicle. You know, a hundred percent, I think, I, you know, I think creativity is is so important and it's yeah i think it kind of should be embraced i mean if 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 anyone took i don't know a bugatti royale or something like that and which there are only six or five or something crazy and and, and decided to you know convert that to, to electric or to or to put a honda engine in it or something like that I'd, yeah i'm not sure how i'd feel about that but you know when you've got <laughs> something where there's there's still you know a healthy quantity of, of you know volkswagen beetles or you know, old Citroens, things like that, then yeah, why why not convert a few of them and, and make them into something different? So. Yeah, similar to um, what they, they just came out with, uh, the classic Bugatti boat tail, um, somebody ordered two, uh, and that's all they made, two custom 
excuse me, Rolls Royce boat tail, not a Bugatti. I don't even, I can't even guess what they paid for these. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they have like custom watch pieces. The boat tail has a picnic set in the back. It's it's insane. Yeah, absolutely crazy. Some of the yeah, some of the some of the things that people are able are able to afford. Um, but yeah, yeah the level yeah. of craftsmanship in them it's it, it's astonishing. You know, you talked about it earlier, but you said you kind of were inspired by some of the cars you've owned. What were some of the cars that you've built that you've owned? Uh, so th yeah, there's a there are a couple in there. So the Citroen DS is is probably the one I was kind of most pleased with. It's one of my most challenging builds as well. Yeah, I had I had one of those uh, back in around 2000. I went over to France and, and, and bought one and brought it back to the UK, registered it here, and I had it as my, my kind of daily driver for a couple of years, which was great. It's a really challenging car to build, firstly, because it's kind of iconic. It's you know, a lot of people think of it as one of the most beautiful cars ever made. I know there are some haters out there as well, but you know, that's what makes life interesting. And it's a, yeah, it's a crazy car. It's, it's, it's narrower at the back than it is at the front. So the, the, the rear wheels are closer together than the front wheels are. Um, to the point where you see one coming down the road towards you and it looks like it's almost crabbing sideways slightly um, mm -hmm. because it kind of messes with your, 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 your visual perception of what a car should look like. So when I created that, it's seven wide at the front and it's six wide at the back. Uh, so again, on that scale to kind of create a model with taper, uh, yeah, it was a head scratcher. It took, it took me a little while. That one wasn't an evening's work, let's put it that way. But I was really proud of how it came out. Um, it was a, yeah, it's something I'd always wanted to build. I've been really reluctant to try it because I knew it would be incredibly difficult. Um, so that was one of them. I also had, uh, before that, I had a Peugeot 404, a classic sedan designed by Pininfarina, and a really, really classy looking car, a lot more conventional than a DS, um, but a really, really nice shape. And I haven't quite yet managed to get the sedan version of it, but I built the pickup version of it because it meant i didn't have to worry about how to make little tail fins and yeah. <laughs> how to work out the rear pillars and things like that it's a lot easier just to, to kind of put a flatbed on the back of it with a with a canvas top on it but i was i was very happy with how the front came out so i've got a kind of half-baked sedan version of it which one day i'll come back to whether i can get the boomerang piece to work as the rear pillar or not i don't know i've spent too many hours fiddling with it so far. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that that usually how that is. You you sit with something for so long, you're like, nope, got to give it up. I'll come back to it, yep. and maybe I'll it'll come to me. And if not, well, then it'll sit there for a couple years. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I've got I've got cupboards full of half finished cars. So yeah. <laughs> what do you have down the production line? Because I, I mean, you continue to come out with these, and I know I've seen quite a few on your website, which we'll talk about too. But is there any that you're just really uh, interest in building here in the future? Um, yeah, I mean, there's some there's some stuff that I'm interested in in doing, and and I suppose it's some it's some of those cars that I I absolutely love, but I've got real doubts over whether I'll be able to pull it off. So I absolutely adore the Citroen SM. So this was the kind of coupe version of the of the DS with a, a Maserati engine in it it's an absolutely fantastic looking car but it's uh it's going to be tricky at, at this scale i've thought about it a lot i've not even got as really got as far as picking up any bricks or or, or even starting to do something in in studio two with it um i'm also a huge fan of the maserati calms in it has to be the european version unfortunately being a 70s car the kind of u.s bumper regulations ruined the u.s version so if anyone goes out there and googles it make sure you find the European version because please don't look at an American one and, and think, well, I think it looks nice um it's a very kind of it's a kind of classic front engined supercar it's kind of Ferrari Daytona kind of feel to it but it's 70s so it's very wedgy it's very very subtle surfaces and I think it's one of those ones where it's kind of not quite square enough when it's not quite rounded enough I'm not sure I can get the subtlety that I really need to kind of get what I think is one of the most beautiful cars ever made. But yeah, those are two on my wish list, but whether they'll happen or not, I have no idea. But I guess in terms of more tangible stuff, I'm kind of thinking again this year of doing something for Halloween. So that's coming up pretty soon. I'm not sure when this is going to go out. So let's see what I come up with for that. I, last year I did the kind of Harry Potter flying Ford Anglia. I'm doing something 
very different this year, but another kind of iconic TV movie kind of themed thing. And I've also got some kind of movie based ideas for something to do at Christmas as well. So starting to, for once, starting to try and plan ahead a little bit. <laughs> other than frantically trying to finish a build on a Friday so that I can photograph it and post it on a Saturday. That's always the most difficult part is planning ahead because you have the idea at the time within a day of what's happening and then you realize, well, I only have a day. Am I going to even be able to do this? I have a life <laughs> outside of that. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's kind of the balance. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I have too many days nervously waiting to see if the post is going to arrive with that one piece that I thought I had that I didn't have that I need to finish the car so that I can mm -hmm. get the photos done. So. <laughs> that kind of leads into some of the things on your website. Like you said, you started to use some digital designs or, or uh, kind of retro engineering some of the builds you've had, but you also have kits. How do you go about doing this? Like if you have somebody order I mean, I don't know how many orders you have constantly going, but it seems that that would be a challenge just to get those parts in. Yeah, that, that that's kind of, yeah, that can be a bit of a challenge. And, and I, for me, the, the kind of kits are there really for, I guess, as a, as a kind of a bit of a thank you from me to, to, to people for, for following and taking an interest in that I, I, I don't really make money on the kits at all i hope this doesn't result in a flood of orders because i'll be bankrupt but, <laughs> <laughs> but no I, I don't lose money on them but i don't really make money they're a bit a la bit of a labor of love they take a long time to to put together so yeah some some of the stuff i've got enough parts in in stock but if i if i end up as i do occasionally if i'm really lucky i'll have you know four or five to kind of get done at the same time I'll just place the orders for the parts because it's it's quicker and easier just to know that I've got a delivery coming with hopefully everything I need to be able to part out right. those five cars and send them off rather than me have to go to the many bags, boxes, tubs of, of bricks that I've got, knowing I've got it in there somewhere, but I've got to try and remember which system I used for uh, for filing those particular pieces in. So yeah, it, it takes a little bit of time. You know, each car can take kind of an hour to sort the pieces for and to sort of check and recheck. And you know, I'm I'm lucky enough that I've had orders from you know all across the world. So I've shipped stuff to Australia, to the US, to China. You know, and and when I'm sending something like that, the last thing I want is for someone to buy one of these as a present for somebody, which is quite often done. And then there'd be a piece missing, or I've then got to, you know, send one piece to the US, and it costs me kind of seven dollars to send the one piece that I forgot, and then I am into into loss making immediately when that kind of stuff happens. So yeah, they are they take some time and they take some focus. So it's nice to be able to do them, and and I'm really happy that I can offer them. But as I say, they're they're kind of one for the fans more than more than the instruction. And I was going to say, everyone who wants these, the instructions are the best way to go so he doesn't go bankrupt <laughs> because most of the build kits are from your instructions. Yeah, exactly. So the instructions are available for everything. And, and what I also do is I also offer the Studio 2 file, which you can then use to upload into BrickLink. So there are instructions on the website for how to do that. So people don't just get a set of instructions and then think hey what have i got what haven't i got what do i need to get and so on you can just take the file upload it and then create a shopping list and and buy the bricks um, but kind of going back to our conversation earlier about the, the kind of studio two sometimes being a little bit too good to be true i have to be careful because sometimes parts start to become scarce and then i realize that I'm kind of offering people the opportunity to get instructions for something and then they'll get the instructions and they find that they can't get that new style red mud guard for the Alfa Romeo in red very easily anymore because it was only ever in one kit. So from time to time, I have to kind of take stuff off the site or change the color scheme or something like that. I try to do it regularly, but it, again, just remembering to check all of those things can be a bit difficult so if anyone ever buys anything and the pieces are a nightmare to get please let me know and i can kind of change it and update it it's always a challenge like you said because parts change colors go you know from super popular to not anymore and then you've got years of difference to kind of rebalance out yeah absolutely absolutely i was so excited to see the 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 new daily bugle kit come out recently with the with the yellow cab in it because the yellow cab has the old style short mud guards in yellow the last four of those i bought i think i paid something like 30 dollars for four mud guards 
well, now they're in this kit. <laughs> I'm hoping that suddenly the the market for yellow ones will 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 kind of soften a little bit and the prices will come down. Yeah, hopefully. I only had two more questions before we kind of finish up our interview today. And one is, it's in particular to one build, your okay. Unamog 437. This seems to be your most popular build ever, at least from Instagram yeah. likes. Why do you think that is? It's a really, it's a really, really interesting question. And, and I think first up, it, it's quite, it kind of changed how I built. I, I was kind of, I guess I was a little guilty of kind of chasing what I thought was glory and chasing numbers and things like that and thinking, what do people want to see? They want to see a Ferrari. They want to see a Lamborghini. And I'd kind of started to dry up a little bit with some inspiration. And I thought, look, I'm just going to build some stuff that I like. Mm-hmm. And I'm a huge fan of Unimogs. And, and I was talking with a friend that I was going to build this Unimog and, and she was saying, you know, you should do something different with it. You know, it, it needs to have some machine, some kind of gadgets on it, something like that would be really cool, add some kind of features and details. And I was out for a walk. It was in the middle of the, the pandemic, in the middle of lockdown. So all I could really do was go for, for walks from my home. And there's some woodlands nearby. And I was walking through and there were a bunch of logs which were ready to be picked up. And I just suddenly thought, hey, what I'll do is I'll build a kind of tr- unimog to go into the forest to pick this timber up and kind of take it back to the road where it can be transferred to a bigger logging truck. And that's what I decided to do. And I, I think it's just something to do with the kind of the, the logs on the back of it, the, the crane, which is incredibly fragile, but does just about hold together long enough to take a photo of it. Um, <laughs> all of that kind of stuff. I, I think it just kind of the whole thing works really nicely as a piece and it kind of manages to look quite realistic, even though it's got a bunch of features on a very small. It took a long time to get the photos right on it. Um, it was probably one of the hardest kind of photo shoots I did. I think I took about 60 shots. Before I got the one that I like. Yeah, I think the fact that it's in the teal color, just, just, there's just a few bits about it that I think somehow uh, sees people's imagination as well. And I'm glad, I mean, I'm really glad that they like it as much. I mean, it, it did really well on Flickr too, which is, yeah. So I, I don't think it was just a, I don't think it was just an algorithmic phenomenon on Instagram, which I know can happen sometimes. I love it. I mean, the color is great because you use that turquoise color uh, and, and having it have that action feature and detailing. Like you said, sometimes we do chase the likes, but other times you just kind of get inspired by life to, to do something that you, you like. The Unamog is a very utilitarian vehicle that, you know, having it in this build just kind of gives it that functionality that you might see in real life. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And and. Yeah, I think I, I think that's the thing. I think it, as I say, it was a real kind of eye opener for me, and you know, I built something that I wanted to do. It mm-hmm. gave me some new challenges to try and cram a few additional details in, and then to see it become so successful, it's, it definitely kind of changed the flavor of how I build. You know, I'll, I'll always build, you know, cars. I'll always build old cars. I'll always build fast cars, but I'll also continue kind of building you know, trucks, off roaders, tractors, tele handlers. Yeah, you name it. There, 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 there's so many kind of fun vehicles out there with with cool little details that I'll uh, I'll have a go at. I think. My final question for you is just to kind of go through your entire life with Lego, and especially recently, and um, as you continue to build, how do you think Lego has affected and changed your life? So it's a it's a very interesting question. I, I think. First off, I kind of come back to what I said earlier on about the kind of community side of it, and I, and I'm not I'm not I'm not big into it. I don't go. I haven't been to any events so far. I've taken part in a couple of build challenges, which have been great fun. But you know, there's there's some guys that I know through Lego just to write to and to kind of talk to, and through the kind of tricky times of early 2020, you know, in the pandemic, working from home, unable to travel, it was really nice to be able to kind of chat to those guys and to kind of share, share thoughts and sort of share sneak previews of things that we had coming up, things that we were working on. I think that was, that was really good. And, and I think, I, I think it just, for me, I've always been a bit of a nerd and I've been a bit of a, a bit of a geek. And, and it, I kind of feel that, in the last 20 years or so, we've started to find our voices a little bit more. And and for me, it's just so cool to be able to do something like this, to have so many people who enjoy what I do, engage with what I do, and like what I do, 
um, and, and just to be able to say to people, hey, look, here's my Instagram feed. Look at this stuff that I do. And people not say, oh, well, you have a lot of followers, but people say, that stuff's really cool. That's so good. And it's the kind of thing I would have thought as a 10 year old, I would have been so embarrassed that you know, oh, I could never, you know, building Lego as an adult, no one would do that. Everyone would laugh at you. Everyone would think you're stupid. And it's just, yeah, it's so refreshing that, that I think this kind of community is there. And it's something that's been recognized, you know, even Lego themselves with the kind of adult themed sets. It's just growing more and more momentum. And, and I see more and more people getting into it and just, yeah, having fun with something which is great kind of great challenge, great therapy. It's like you said, you've been a nerd with Lego or a geek for a very long time. And that's what Lego kind of, they did. They brought out the adults that, you know, have kind of been embarrassed by it. And through the pandemic, you know, people needed something. And as they reached out to those that are now adults and they kind of pulled them back into, you know, Hey, I'm proud of what I do. I, I like doing this and I can be myself and find out that, Oh, you know, the, someone you've been friends with for a while also has been an obsessive person with Lego or now just found out that they like Lego. And it builds a community. Like you said, you, you find people that are like-minded and have a better voice now, which I think is the best way to put it is you've accepted yourself and now other people are too. It's not about your followers. It's about the builds. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And for everyone out there, this is definitely some place to start for you. If you like cars, you can definitely go and get some of his instructions. Um, don't rush the kits, <laughs> uh, but there are some probably. Um, but you can check out his work at JE underscore Brickworks. You can also go to his Flickr page and his website, which all are going to be posted in the show notes. Jonathan, thank you again for taking the time today. I really appreciate you know, talking about your models and getting down to how you would build these. That's the whole point is get the creative side, get the backstory and learn why you love to build cars. Great. Well, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you and, and yeah, thanks. Thanks for letting me kind of talk through yeah, my, my kind of passion and, and my little Lego world. Well, thank you again, Jonathan. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Great. Thanks ever so much. And for everyone out there, as I said, you can follow him and look at his awesome builds and grab a couple for yourself. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast on any of your podcast listening apps at back to brick That's the number two. And follow us on our Instagram at back to brick 2 If you're interested in coming on the show or want to be part of the team, you can send me a message through there. And I'll leave you as I always do. Get creative, get out there, and go build something.